do the rest. Thank you very much, Michael. What I wanted to do tonight is give you three uh, scenarios for an introduction for Carl instead of one. First one goes something like this. There's an anecdote about um, Albert Einstein that goes something like this. At the begin beginning of each lecture, he would take a ping pong ball and throw it up against the wall behind him. He would do that every day, every lecture. And finally, one of the more awake, one of the more interesting stu students got up and said, uh, Professor Einstein, why do you throw that ping pong ball up against the wall every day? And he answered to the student, well, according to my calculations, one day it's going to pass right through the wall. And I wanted to use that as a kind of uh, an introduction to maybe some of the uh, as aspects of Carl's critical architecture that I have uh, understood through uh, eight years of discussions with him. So proceeding from that, I would ask, ask all of you again to maybe uh, consider these questions. What is architecture? How can the self address an historical body whose presencing sweeps over many millennia? How can one construct an engagement without desecration, without willful domination, and without self-induced amnesia? How can one approach architecture? And on what terms can it be approached? What can one say to architecture? And what right does one have to call oneself an architect? And finally, as architects, what is our obligation? The nature of the covenant we sign with architecture. And how does this covenant open and bring forth the wellspring of humanity, of which we hope it will do and has done? Walter Benjamin, history is not a cumulative additive narrative in which the uninterrupted syntam of time flows homogeneously from past, past to future but rather a montage where any moment may ent enter into sudden adjacency with another. History as parataxis, time scattered through space like stars, its course no longer taking the form of progress, but leaping forth in the momentary flashes of dialectical constellations. Scenario two, context, the age of crisis. As exiles exposed to forgetting and revisionist history, we reach into the city, into books, into our minds, and into our hearts to stitch together projects and documents and subject them to an imprecise critique of pure narration, which essentially wills itself towards a projection or a reflection of how things really were, an act of reconstruction, or rather how things really are, or perhaps the way they will be as if we have a kind of unsettled debt to settle with architecture itself. This act represents a reconciliation between the past, the present, and the future, and especially all points in between, caught in between. As such, these words will towards an architecture, towards conception, towards birth, and towards life, backed by blind faith that they will actually end up but end up where, and for whom, and for when, and when, excuse me. Contemporary architectural discourse offers a wide array of influences, conditions, contexts, ideologies, and causalities, which have been sampled, further being exiled from other contexts, and essentially become remotivated in their new continuum. Answering the call from their space of deep slumber, these influences are hopeful and youthful again, and they are not in great pain, nor do they resurface unwillingly. In the age of crisis, a kind of sp uh, specter haunts us. It is a specter which is brought forth by the diaspora of architecture. It's break up into separate tribes. In this current diasporic uh, fragmentation of modernity, architecture's ma marginalized status can be imagined as an immobile patient etherized on an operating table. Meanwhile, the recent past that haunts us is the faint memory of a willful and youthful modern architecture, 
of which 70 years after its inception, we can only project a ghosted image of its utopian, universalist aspirations, undone and redone in the postmodern. Clearly, architecture itself is neither an invited nor an integrated inhabitant in our advanced contemporary global capitalist culture. It has been said that history, the history of architecture, or as I would say, knowledge, and culture is a history of the transumption of models from Frederick Jameson. The continual cycle of creation and destruction of these models is one of the foundations of the notion of intellectual and moral progress and serves as the basic dialectic that stages the moral uh, progress, uh, excuse me, that stages the evolution of the Western logos. The models which served the ancients were models based in myth as opposed to science. Mythic constructs answer to why the world is as it is when empirical cause and effect scenarios cannot be seen or when it is suppressed, thus supplying us with a meaning-filled world. In retrospect, the duration of the event of creation and destruction of any particular model seems unbearably slow, and we are tempted to dismiss this anamorphosis to various tangential occurrences, such as fluctuations in the acceptance of new information based on the power structure of the Western world, or the global world at this point. The protracted rate of change of mythic constructs seems to voice a universally human conservative mistrust of changes. A suspicion that progress is anything but progress, and a reluctance to accept transformations of the established order of things. This tension is the embodiment of our Western teleological conception of structure, stasis, perspective, and discrete thingness. The Apollonian sky cult intersecting the Dionysian earth cult. The protean intermediate flux of evolution. Our inherited modernity certainly had its goals, which lay in the crucial condition of modern science, the movement towards secular reason overturning the divine revelation, and the liberation of the arts from the self-serving power of Western theology. Through the loss of the transcendent dimension and the grand narrative, our displacement has led to a condition of homelessness or exile within this world, the modern nomad. Within the plurality of value systems and ideologies, there has been a loss of the authorita authoritative standards of the good, the true and the beautiful, to which reason had created during the Age of Enlightenment and whose metacritique was further inst inst instigated through Nietzsche's proclamation regarding the death of God towards the end of the 19th century. Scenario three. I once asked Carl if his pursuit of architecture lay within the realm of science or theology. And I'll give you an analogous answer in the form of a splicing together of the story of Jacob in Genesis and um, a fragment from uh, A Thousand Plateaus by Deleuze and Guitari. Recounted, visited in a dream. We'll hope for a little alchemy and Kabbalistic assistance here. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. Felt is a supple solid product that proceeds altogether differently as an anti-fabric. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched Jacob's hip at the socket so that the socket of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. An amorphous collection of juxt juxtaposed pieces that can be joined together in an infinite number of ways. We see that patchwork is literally a Riemannian space. In simplest terms, Boulez says that in smooth nomadic space-time, one occupies without counting, whereas in a striated space-time, one counts in order to occupy. It is haptic rather than optical, a body without organs. Then he said, let me go for dawn is breaking. But he answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Said the other, what is your name? He replied, Jacob. Said he, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with beings divine and human and have prevailed. Jacob asked, pray, tell me your name. But he said, you must not ask my name. And he took leave of him there. 
never believe that smooth space will, will suffice to, to save us. So Jacob named the place Peniel, meaning I have a, seen a divine being face to face, yet my life has been preserved. That is as, as alive as a continuous variation. Ladies and gentlemen, Carl Chu. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, uh, Eric. I felt that I, uh, you have spoken every, everything that I could possibly think of uh, saying. Uh, <laughs> I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Keith, for that uh, storm. <laughs> you know, you can do crazy things like that when you're on sort of home ground, right? Sort of. Uh, I suddenly, for one thing, don't want to, I can't see anybody here, it's just like an anonymous sort of mass of uh, something, I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, but I don't want to uh, perceive myself as being a man who mistook himself to be a storm, especially this type of storm. Uh, the reason I show that uh, storm is that uh, it's quite fascinating, not only for the formal aspect of uh, generating architecture, but uh, I think the very methods and of the way we produce architecture is uh, changing by the advance of science and technology, natural government and math, and so forth, and that we are participating in a very exciting time. Uh, I told my students every time I uh, was thinking about giving class yesterday, why do you want to study architecture? We're living in a very incredible time. How often do you uh, experience the change of the transition in the millennium, the second millennium? And of course, uh, the idea of a millennium, the idea of time, the idea of calendar, calendrical system, right? 1994 today, March 30th, I guess, the date is, is quite complex because everything is woven into the structure of time in which we invent, you know, part of the cosmological time. Uh, we are born into it, so to speak, but the time that we're born into is not just natural, it's not a given condition of uh, time of the universe, of the time of the solar system. But on top of that, there is an artificial time, the time of the specific calendar. And that calendar is not the Aztec calendar. Um, 
not the uh, Egyptian calendar, not the Chinese calendar. <coughs> so architecture is uh, interwoven. Now, I, I wrote this. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to read this. Uh, after I wrote that, uh, I said, did I write that stuff? Yeah, because I was perplexed you know, at night you know, when you're typing up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You felt like you were sort of thinking and meditating sort of something profound. And I, after I wrote it this morning, I went to bed. And I read it. I just couldn't believe that I wrote that stuff. You know, I definitely was a different being at that time at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, when you're tired at uh, 9 o'clock, when you woke up, you look at this, you say, what is this stuff? But anyway, coming back to the notion of time, uh, I was saying that uh, architecture and everything else, especially now the global culture, uh, is uh, being permeated by certain notions of time, and that uh, everything is structured according to that time. You know, the fact that it's on Wednesday, the fact that the school is structured on a certain uh, time of the year, that uh, you know, Sunday is a day of holiday, so to speak, uh, that we don't do work. Uh, and that's an architectural notion. And normally we speak of architecture in, uh, simply in terms of uh, designing buildings and so forth. And we take over granted. And here I wrote here you know, uh, the very first phrases, uh, uh, what Eric Kahn uh, just said, you know, what is architecture? Right, so uh, most of us come to school knowing, well, especially uh, when I used to be on the uh, mission committee, interviewing students coming to architecture, and one of the questions that we have to ask is, why do you want to study architecture? If you don't make money, why do you want to do that? You know, that's a little masochist or something, right? <clears throat> and it's very interesting to hear, uh, listen to, uh, can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. Because as you speak to the microphone, sort of this thing, sort of, point at your face, the tendency just to shy away from this funny stuff that is. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was saying that uh, you interview uh, students coming to architecture, and you say, well, why do you want to do architecture? And it's very interesting in the sense that everybody has a perception or conception or preconception of what architecture is about, right? And so uh, based on that preconception, they made the decision for various reasons that you know, they in fact want to study architecture. And in many cases, people said, oh, well, you know, I want to do art, but it doesn't make money. But at the same time, you know, maybe perhaps something art and engineering in between, you know, maybe something more practical and professional like architecture, that might do it. Uh, in fact, there are some people who make decisions like that uh, to study architecture. But anyway, uh, to cut it short, uh, when I accepted to show my work, <laughs> I said, you know, look, I have not built anything. What are you going to show them? Especially on home ground, you know, because you have reputation at stake. And here already I'm known as somebody who, is, who doesn't do buildings. And uh, one of the students uh, in my studio uh, came to me uh, during the uh, sign up for the vertical studio. So, you know, Carl, are you going to build, do buildings this semester? I said, you bet I'm going to do buildings. But are you going to do buildings? So, anyway. Uh, but the problem is much more complex than that, right? Um, the building, uh, if you look into the Western Dictionary, architecture is defined as the art of making building. And the term building, like everything else, like time, like you know, everything that we are involved in, is quite complex. And so it took me, uh, well, it, I'm not going to suggest that it took me all these years, but it's still an evolving question as to what is architecture. And when I set up to, uh, give a talk at SIOC, one of the reason that I like to, well, the, the, one of the reasons why I decided to do it is that because I felt that uh, there's a kind of a, a, an ethical responsibility to expand, because uh, every age has their own sort of conception of perceptual architecture, and I think our age also, I mean, especially with the, around the turn of the uh, millennium, a lot of things are happening outside of architecture, and it's extremely exciting. And I think it's very important that architecture incorporates those kind of ideas, methodologies, perceptions of you know, reality, and so forth, into architecture and expand so that the field of architecture become enriched, so that uh, ultimately we can uh, be in sync, so to speak, with time and evolution of ideas and evolution of everything else. And uh, after I've uh, accepted to 
the talk, uh, I start thinking about what I'm going to say. Uh, during the last couple of weeks, the one thing that I came to my mind consistently was uh, when I first went to School of Architecture. That was in the University of Houston, just in case nobody told you. Uh, and my first teacher was Donald Bothamy. <clears throat> he was almost 80 at the time. I'm sorry, you still cannot hear me, yeah? Okay. This funny stuff that is... Uh... So, uh, <clears throat> Donald Bothamy was my... <laughs> Cervax. I have a story to tell about Cervax also. Uh, <laughs> You know, Donald Baldemir at the time was about 80 years old. Uh, he, at the time, that was in 70, I think, two or three. Uh, by the way, uh, somebody called from Houston, uh, who was a colleague of mine, uh, told the secretary that he's coming. I'm just wondering who that person is. Uh, but anyway, so Donald Baldemir was my first teacher, and uh, you know, the first of uh, the freshman year, there were about 120 students. It was a big school. And he gave us three projects. Uh, and the first project is the question, who are you? Okay, we have the first slides. Oh, I do have the control. Oh, okay. Thanks, Keith. Left is my left or your left? Oh, the audience. Oh, okay, all right. So this is my right. <laughs> it's not working. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. There you go. All right. And one of the uh, he gave us three projects. The first project is that you know, uh, who are you? And we are supposed to write a, a little brief about who you are. You know, from whichever vantage point that you think who you are. So uh, pr think about it and so turn it in tomorrow. And the second project he uh, gave us, uh, by the way, that was on the first day of class. It's called Orientation into Architecture. He says that uh, screen, you know, that was in a big auditorium, there are about 120 people. And so everybody looked at each other and said, you know, screen, you know, what do you mean? What is that to do with architecture? We all come here to study, to do buildings, so it's screen. So uh, we, all of us, about 120 or so of these students, started screaming, you know, sort of make the feeble attempt to uh, scream, everybody's kind of somewhat reserved and shy because you, know, you, know, you don't know the other people, they're all strangers. So everybody screamed, and he says, that's not good enough, you guys are not screaming, is there a wimpish? Is there a, uh, yeah. So he told us really, I mean, you really have to scream, I mean, like a primal scream, just scream out all of that frustrations, whatever. He didn't say that, but just scream. So after a few tries, the whole auditorium started sort of trembling and you know, screaming. Like, okay, good. You finished your second project, he said. And then uh, the third project that he gave us was well, design a pin. You know, like a pin. Everybody look at each other. Pin. So design the smallest pin that you can make. Right? It's up to you how you make it. And so he said, bring it on Wednesday, right? The next. So we have to, on Wednesday, we have to turn in a little brief about uh, <clears throat> who you are and design a pin. And of course, uh, nobody can really design a pin. I mean, I mean, I don't mean design, but make a model of a pin, the smallest pin that you can make. He said, don't cheat. Don't go buy a little pin, ready-made pin, but you have to make one. And obviously, everybody fails. And he says that uh, during the review, how many angels can they dance on top of your pin? And uh, from what I can remember, uh, those, some of the pins are really big. And I venture to say that a lot of angels can probably dance on top of the tiny little pin, <clears throat> whatever angels are. Uh, by the way, Donald Bothamy was the uh, father of the late uh, Donald Bothamy Jr. that uh, perhaps some of you might know, that the writer, quite, quite interesting author in its own right. So I, you know, those three projects had uh, remained etched in my mind all these years. And curiously enough, uh, lately it surfaced again. Uh, so I would ask you the same thing. Uh, if you know how to 
make a fine little pin and go to the wood shop or wherever you want to, however you wish to do it. Show me. Show me one that you can fabricate. The finest little point that you can manufacture or fabricate. Measure the diameter, measure the height, measure the, uh, whatever, and maybe perhaps write up uh, how you go about doing it. And then, uh, maybe perhaps use that pen as a kind of measuring device to measure how big is your soul. So having said that, uh, I would read what I've written here. It's not very long. Uh, in fact, I was not going to uh, talk this much about uh, little introduction uh, myself. I was trying to, you know, here at SIA, you know, so visually oriented, including myself, uh, that sort of give you a brief about what these things are and then just show you a bunch of images overloaded. And in fact, I hope I, I won't overload you too much with images tonight because I was going to overload you. And uh, I remember I asked Eric Khan, he said, what are you going to show? And everybody thinks well, you have not built, you have not really published anything, you have not shown anything. And the tested assumption is that uh, I don't mean to uh, critical, but uh, so, so, you have not really done much. You talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> because I think architecture has a sort of humorous dimension. I'm sometimes at 3 o'clock finding myself writing this stuff and just sort of laughing at my own sort of words. Uh, but here, I'm going to read here. It's only about eight pages, double-spaced. So the first line is, what is architecture? It's pretty serious. I can't believe it. But I'm going to read it since I wrote it, so I'm going to read it. The term architecture is used in many contexts, ranging from science to philosophy to informatics. For instance, it is not uncommon for cognitive scientists to speak in terms of the architecture of neural networks, whatever that is of philosophy to address the architecture of Hegel's philosophical system. It is clear that uh, they are speaking about the constitutive structure of relationships of these systems, right? Almost everyone knows what architecture is or is about, and every student of architecture already presupposes an idea of architecture, uh, just as I told you earlier about uh, my experience of having to uh, been in an admissions committee. And in many cases, these preconceptions, I'm sorry, these preconceptions serve as the basis of motivation for the desire to pursue the field of, the field of architecture. Mm -hmm. In the attempt to define architecture, one is ultimately lead through a, a chain of reasoning to metaphysics. The word architecture, like many other words, I'm sorry, the word architecture, like many other words within Indo-European languages, has its root in the Greek language and is explicitly a metaphysical concept. And why do I say that? Why is it a metaphysical concept? For instance, uh, if you take painting, right, because it defines an activity and the dis discipline is named after that activity, or if you, you know, there are many others, but architecture is not. There's no direct correspondence to its uh, sort of semantic content and its uh, activity, but there's a philosophical connection. And I think that's a more interesting one. So the, the term architecture refers to two terms, uh, the Greek terms, the Greek words, so archai, A-R-C-H-E, and techne. The meaning of archae pertains to first principles or the underlying structure of things and technique according to Heidegger's interpretation, which is not neutral, concerns the technique or method of disclosure, which is itself a form of craft and intimately tied to the notion of art. And for those of you who want to read Heidegger's notion about art and architecture, read the origins of a work of art. I do not mean that because of its etymology, architecture is only a Greek phenomenon. It is evident that there have always been other forms of architecture other than Greek. Still, the term is used within the English language to refer to the glo global condition of the discipline. A literal interpretation of these two terms would lead to the concept of architecture. I'm hearing this term delay, so reverberation. Uh, a literal interpretation of these two terms would lead to the conception of architecture as the art of dis disclosure of the underlying structure of reality. And that's not a very popular notion. Deconstruction took it apart 10,000 times. But uh, I still think that that's a very significant notion. Because without that kind of a faith or uh, interest, science or philosophy would not be possible. This is a highly abstract and general notion that implicates architecture with, along with everything else and everything there is. 
and consequently opens the field of architecture as the field of practice of all conceivable levels of engagement with reality. This is a complex issue which I will address a little later. Page two. For now, it suffices to say that all forms of architectural discourse and productions are already embedded within semiological regimes and life world experiences, which in turn are complex metamorphic expressions of implicit or explicitly held metaphysical suppositions. And so don't be surprised, tomorrow morning you wake up at three, and say, am I a metaphysician? Right. So uh, sort of ideas and sort of notions or suppositions operating through me without my knowing it, so to speak. These suppositions orient online motives which find ex expressions in the form of invisible strands within a, di a disposition, I'm sorry, invisible strands within a dispositional matrix that cumulatively amounts to an axiological framework constituted of a generalized cultural paradigm, paradigm tacitly held by a social collective. Do I have to point at the image or something? My chance of my theme. Where do I point here? You guys see the movie uh, Being There? This man who lived in this house for, I don't know, a good 60, 70 years, and one day uh, he went out into the uh, city. The government doesn't have any sort of record for him. He doesn't know the culture of outside, the system outside. And the only sort of device that he left with was this remote control. So everywhere he goes, he could click at the wall. If he doesn't like it, he's like, click it, change the channel, right? Now, f phrase two. So before I expand on the notion of architecture as the embodiment and expression of semiological regimes, regimes, allow me to reflect on a more fundamental question within which the conception of the practice of architecture is embedded. And the question is, on one level, it's a very simple question that seems almost too obvious to ask. And when it is raised to the status of a question, it usually el elicited a response that is almost always in a state of suspension and disbelief and seldom does it lead to any rigorous discourse. The question, if I have the audacity to ask, is what is reality? And we all know what reality is, supposedly. The question of reality is related to yet another question, why is there something rather than nothing? Heidegger asked that question in his book uh, on metaphysics, and so did uh, Leibniz, uh, echoing one of the medieval uh, philosophers. So at least we know that reality is in some kind of relationship to the something that exists. As a concept, it is the largest of all possible concepts. Can you think of a concept that is larger than, bigger than reality? Because everything, is, everything else is contained within it, right? I have to make sure that the slides uh, correspond to what I'm saying. And it functions as the limit of all limits concept, all limit concepts beyond which there is no other concepts without being in some way get implicated or contained within the scope of this limiting concept called reality. No doubt that this is a paradoxical, um, this is paradoxical in that the concept of its limit is already subsumed by its seemingly unlimited dimension of its obscurity, even though we know what reality is about, each of us do. You know, we have a version of our own sort of conception of reality. So, I mean, because of this kind of seemingly unlimited dimension of this obscurity, uh, which led Anaximander, a pre-Socratic philosopher, to re refer to it, it as the non-limited, as opposed to being the limit concept. Are the two terms referring to the same phenomena, meaning reality and something that exists? Or can we think of reality as possibly referring to an inconceivable phenomena that is beyond something? And also, what do we mean when we say that something is real? Does the notion of reality refer to any predicate, substantive or otherwise? Is it a subject without a predicate? No doubt that it is a subject whose predicate is in an eternal state of suspension. And as such, we might ask as to the nature of this, I mean, we might ask as to the nature of this suspension. Is this suspended state co-equivalent with the metaphysical notion of being? Is not being with a capital B, capital E, capital I, N, G? Is not, is not being already in an eternal state of suspension? 
a metaphysics of the compression of, I'm sorry, a metaphysics of, a metaphysics of compression of the in-between states where all possible past and all possible futures are inscribed within the suspended state of the present as an eternal given. Being is always suspended in a state of eternity. In framing the question of reality in correspondence to being, which is another very abstract notion, are we not already determining its character? Can reality be thought of as referring to a condition that is beyond being, as Emmanuel Levinas invoked in his book title, Otherwise Than Being and Beyond Essence? I would recommend it to you if you're interested in looking into the book. The conception and reflection of being is as old as the question of reality itself. According to Parmenides, one of the first serious philosophers of Western metaphysics, being is the other of non-being, again spelled with the capitals. Being is real and unchanging, and non-being is not. Parmenides conceptualized being not as a physical phenomenon, but as a metaphysical totality, and that is infinite yet bounded. And the image that he invokes is that of an infinitely large sphere. This geometrization of a metaphysical idea is the first rigorous attempt to symbolize a model of the vision of reality. Prevailing philosophical wisdom tends to, wisdom tends to be literal in interpreting Parmenides' conce conception of being in that it is opposed to the concept of change and movement. Let it suffice for the moment to say that along with Gödel, being is not antithetical to change and the embodiment of time, but that it is inclusive of all possible modalities of tensed existence. Tense like and T and S E D tends to existence. If, however, we suspend the use of this hyperpregnant term being to designate the concept of reality, we still feel a strong need to attribute some positive content such as the indeterminate it, capital I, capital T. If so, then we must ask, along with Socrates, another philosopher who didn't write anything, said, what is it? Is this just a game of substitution? This indeterminate it is just as elusive. Is it a phenomenal thing of some kind? What exactly do we mean when we say it is raining? What is it that rains? No doubt that language conceals as much as it reveals about the expressive content of its predication. And if, we, and if we associate the it that reigns as a referential function of reality, then are we not engaged in a circumlocutionary deferral, a delay that never quite captures the content within the totality of a categorical notion? I do not think that this is merely a, silk, a slippage of meaning or of being caught in an unending but circular chain of signification, even though they are part of an intrinsic condition. I think it refers to something more profound. And these are the thoughts that was occurred to me at three o'clock in the morning. Along with Kant and Gödel, if we concede that the completeness and knowledge of any conception of reality, be it objective or otherwise, is not knowable, since we are a part of it, encompassed by it, and far exceedingly beyond anything that we can experience, then we feel nevertheless compelled to conceive an, to conceive an essentially inconceivable phenomena in terms of an all-encompassing indeterminate category, which includes the all, with a capital A. The moment we attempt to designate these ubiqu ubiquitous terms with a, categor with a categorical universal quantifier, we lapse into paradox specifically Russell's uh, paradox, uh, the British philosopher Russell, yeah. name of the English one, which states that the set of all sets is itself not a set, and therefore there is no such a thing as the set of all sets. The hidden ambition of the concept of reality is precisely its desire to be the set of all sets, a universal set, and, precise, and in doing so, laps into a paradox that cancels itself out, and as a consequence, discloses that abstract space of the other, the abstract space of the other, that murmurs within the anonymous language of language, of the language of being. The other is that surplus of the unnameable, uh, which is quite uh, been uh, referred to earlier, 
the universe of the unsayable, the suspended state of the undecidable, the distant echo of the inexhaustible within an infinite dimensional space. And most significantly, its, sus its sustenance lies in its capacity to continually invoke an, ex an inexhaustible dynamics of inconsistent multiplicities, whose fate is perhaps a perpetual motion machine that evolves and devolves, and that evolves and dissolves in, in alternation as it dissipates around its multitude of unspecifiable centers. Can we, along with, can we, along with Aristotle, say that the unmoved mover, by virtue of its immobility, moves, moves everything? Where has this led us? On the right, you see a diagram of, uh, from the uh, book on logic called Modal Logic. It talks about the, uh, the universe of all possible states of affairs. And so uh, it's quite common for philosophers, as opposed to physicists, to speculate philosophically about the uh, possibility of the existence of all other possible worlds other than the one that we live in or the one that we uh, know of through science and physics. So if you look at uh, the top of the right slide, it says all possible worlds. Right underneath there is uh, non-actual worlds. Right? It's physically impossible, physically possible. And then the actual world occupies only a tiny region of this whole spectrum of possible existence. <clears throat> you know, for architecture, we're not so, uh, we normally don't think about these physically impossible worlds or non-actual worlds or all possible worlds. What does that to do with architecture? Architecture always deals with the actual world, the buildable, the nature of materials, has the logic of necessities based on programmatic and political interests and so forth. And the minute you throw go outside of this little rectangle and to talk about these things, you are in the middle of nowhere and uh, liable to suffer from being so uh, branded as a kind of a lunatic. <coughs> but I think it's, uh, if you, uh, but I, I think it's, uh, it's necessary sometimes to, uh, to think, uh, even though it might not have immediate bearing on your life, but I think it's, uh, it's quite, uh, uh, you might find something enlightening. So where has this led us? At this point, I will venture to say that reality is the embodiment of modal space. Just in case, uh, for some of you, you think that I'm not going to show slides. After this, I finish reading, I'm just going to stop talking and just show you, uh, bombard you with images. So where has this led us? At this point, I will venture to say that reality is the embodiment of modal space. Yeah, modal space in that sense. This is called modal logic. And is endowed with a modal structure that is infinite in its attribute. Being as the global specification of reality, conceived in terms of an undifferentiated wholeness, is an abstract plane of consistency, out of which emerges mechanisms of purification that are on the plane of expression. If the modal structure of reality is infinite, one has to assume that you know, there are infinite number of possible worlds, which Leibniz first speculated in the late 17th or 18th century. So if the modal structure of reality is infinite, then it, po it points to the notion of an infinite universe which Contained, which I'm sorry, which contains within itself an infinite number of internal states, both in time and in hyperspace. It therefore must have an infinite number of connected branches, even though it may, at any specific internal state, only has a finite number of branches from each node. Does it mean that it will take an infinite amount of time to visit all the infinite number of evolutions and its universe of correlations? Does this allude to the notion of the potential infinite? By the way, uh, Aristotle's notion of infinity is uh, the two terms. One is potential infinite and the actual infinite. Cantor, who is the father of modern uh, set theory and also who we discovered uh, infinity, hated this notion of a potential infinity. He says that the concept of infinity is actual. So does this allude to the notion of potential infinite as, as, as opposed to the actual infinite since it traverses through time within the domain of its medical such space? By the way, here I'm borrowing terms from Aristotle just in case you think I'm sort of uh, talking about these free-floating sort of non-determinate meanings. These concepts derive from Aristotle and who was also very much influenced by Plato and Parmenides uh, before them. So we're talking about metaphysical such, uh, metaphysical such space within which the all possible 
so a state of affairs can take place. Time, according to Plato, is the moving image of eternity. Since the notion of reality is the comprehensive notion of once and for all, it again points to the fact that it's, its, embodiment of, its embodiment of modal space is essentially in congruence with the embodiment of the actual infinite. It already, con it already contains within itself the meta genetic code for the conditions of its own creative possibility. Provocative as it may seem, logical necessity entails logical existence, and logical existence in concrete terms implies formal systems. Yeah, there's a formal diagram. <clears throat> I think that these diagrams are quite self-evident. Uh, here you have the laws of nature, laws of causality, and then, uh, the physics or mathematics decode them in terms of a formal system. So there's the encodings of a trajectory here, and the decodings go back to uh, the natural system. And on the left is, actually, yeah, on, the, on your left is the same diagram, but through another, through another implication. Formal systems implying machines here, yeah, right? like the computer, for instance. And here's, uh, here, in this uh, specific diagram, it's referring to a Turing, a universal Turing machine that processes information sequentially. So that's why it's called string uh, processing. And so that storm that I show you, the computer simulation of a model of a storm is essentially an artifact that is produced in that space. Okay, so this isn't it? So a modeling of reality back here in that region here. So, but, in, and of course, it's continuously sort of feed, fed back with new information that reconfigures and, and then represent one more time its own simulation of reality. And this is crucial because uh, if you don't understand the concept of simulation and you know, virtual sort of object, uh, and if you jump into you know, virtual reality, what is taking place is essentially that mechanosphere that is produced, the reality that is produced by the interaction of machines at that stage. And so, it creates its own possibility. Machines have their own logic, have their own possibility and impossibility. Like for instance, most, most of us um, uh, doing architecture based, utilize instruments. In fact, the very first uh, machine is a Euclidean machine, a straight edge and a compass. And that's a machine, that's an abstract machine. Whereas the parallel bar and the compass that you literally use are approximations of that abstract machine. But abstract machines have theoretical significance in the sense that they have gone through formal systems. Once they incarnate or sort of manifest themselves as physical tools, then they become machines. Du uh, Descartes also, in the uh, 16th century, invented another abstract machine, another type of a geometrical con constructive uh, instrument. And of course, uh, closer to us, uh, around early part of this century, you have uh, Alan Turing. Right, the British mathematician and computer scientist. In fact, uh, he's the father of modern computer, other than Babbage. Uh, he came up with this notion of a universal Turing machine, you know, which is essentially the model for which uh, all the uh, modern computers are based on. So all the computers that you buy from, you know, that cost only $90 to the supercomputers, millions of dollars, they are essentially based on a very simple idea of a Turing machine. It's just that some of them are faster. So um, let me see where I, that's the thing about reading is that you gotta be in touch with the, the sentence. So does this allude to the notion of the potential infinite as opposed to the actual infinite since it traverses through time within the domain of its metaphysical such space? And that's a very significant notion. And for us, uh, I was talking to Michael Dobry, uh, who I enjoyed uh, discussing many things, not on modal space. But well, the idea of a search space is very interesting because the minute you frame it, you have to search for the configuration of the generation of form within the parameters that you've established. So, you know, there are various possible solutions within search space. So you know, the solution that you come up uh, as a proposal for architecture is just one possible version among many. Time, according to Plato, I'm sort of repeating myself, is the moving image of eternity. That's a beautiful so, phrase. I've wondered about what exactly it means. Time is, the beautiful, time is the moving image of eternity. Since the notion of reality is a comprehensive notion of once and for all, 
something about this. Sort. Anyway, it again points to the fact that its embodiment of modal space is essentially in congruence with the embodiment of the actual infinite. It already contains within itself the metagenetic code for the conditions of its, of its own creative possibility. Provocative as it may seem, logical necessity entails logical existence. And logical existence in concrete terms implies formal systems, which in, which in turn implies machinic attribution. The various attributes of machinic orders in turn express the emergence, the emergence of a mechanosphere. This is a term that I borrow from uh, Deleuze and Guattari, whereby they in turn superposes onto the biosphere on the phenomenal level. So that kind of a, a circular motion sort of feedback. It's the mechanosphere feeding back onto the biosphere, so they mutually sort of implicate each other and change and transform uh, each other. So nothing is really disconnected. The stage has always been set for this phenomenology of co-evolution within a multitude of epigenetic landscapes at all levels of bifurcations and branches of being. Adaptive differentiation within fitness landscapes allow for the profusion of phylogenetic evolution of mechanism leading to a machinic phylum, another phrase from Deleuze, which according to Deleuze and Guattari, self-organizes along rhizomatic trajectories which are nomadic prol proliferations in every conceivable direction. Then we'll ask, where are the origins of order? They are everywhere and nowhere. Like the fearful sphere of Pascal, recount recounted by Borges in his book on the labyrinth, says the universe is a paradoxical sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. But before that, the logic of uh, Pascal's re reasoning was paved by Nicholas of Cusa, and the reason I'm sort of going through this is because uh, the perception and conception of the universe that we have inherited, that we embody now, has a whole sort of, has gone through a whole evolution of transformation of paradigms and thoughts. So we are not just our own making in that sense. We are part of the historical development. And our perception is not neutral because it is already framed by that uh, conception. The logic of Pascal was paced by Nicholas of Cusa in the 14th century. You know, Nicholas of Cusa was known as the last of the medieval philosopher and the first modern philosopher. When he speculated that, uh, by the way, according to Parmenides, the universe is an infinitely large sphere, you know, so big that nobody can see it, but, uh, but nevertheless it is infinite. So Nicholas of Cusa speculated that if the universe is an infinitely large sphere, then its circumference must coincide with its tangent and therefore it must no longer be a sphere. Right, the minute the, the, the circumference co coincide with the tangent, then it's technically speaking, it's not quite a sphere. So um, he paved this way for the uh, prol uh, proliferation of the uh, notion of a multiple universe, the decomposition of the wholeness of, 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 of the symbol of, of reality. <laughs> so with the, co with the collapse of the singular representation of the reality of being as an infinite sphere, Giordano Bruno, during the early stage of the Renaissance, celebrated the, celebrated the existence of the plurality, plurality of the universe, along with Copernicus. And of course, Copernicus, uh, scientifically, is uh, known as uh, the one scientist who paved the way for the, the multiple concept of, concept of a plur, pl plurality of the universe. And so but, uh, and Giordano Bruno was a very outspoken uh, philosopher quite flamboyant, in fact. And, uh, so the church was after him and finally caught up with him and it's like a burning at the stake. So that really happened. Which in turn, uh, a century or so later, led Leibniz to meditate on the notion of the universe as the best of possible worlds. Uh, you, we might think that they're, they're crazy, but you know, these guys are uh, uh, speculating on the, you know, what the nature of the reality is. So, you know, he says that it, you know, Again, even up, uh, closer to us, Einstein, one of his uh, famous uh, questions is that uh, he wants to know whether God has any choice in the creation of the universe, you know, however he created it. That is, if you believe that God created it, but Einstein did, and he said that, does God have any choice in the creation of the universe? And he really would like to know. And in fact, uh, his subjective aspiration for doing physics is you know, to know how the mind of God works. And by studying physics, you know, by studying his, God's artifacts, so to speak, 
you know, he would have access to that logic of, of the divine. So it is an irony of metaphysics that it takes the collapse of a singularity in order to discover a space of modality, of infinite proliferation, only to realize that the modal space that is already implicit, only to realize that modal space is already already implicit and folded within the invisible hypersphere of the Parmenidia notion of being. What is time? As Saint Augustine in the fourth century, you know, who uh, in his book on Confessions, which incidentally is one of the first autobiographical book in the West, and I would uh, recommend uh, all of you to read uh, St. Augustine. He says that uh, if he doesn't think about time, he knows exactly what time is about, but the minute he starts thinking about time, he said, I have no idea what that is. So, but uh, all I can be sure is that uh, the present exists, right? Uh, the philosophy of the now, the phenomenology of the present. And so what about yesterday? You know, I experienced that I've gone through yesterday. I know that the yesterday was there, but it's not here. But what about future? Yesterday, I know that uh, I mean, today will be here, and therefore, I'm quite sort of certain that uh, to tomorrow will be there too, tomorrow. So, but he says the one thing you can show is only the present. So he came up with this notion of, it, you know, this is the phenomenological version, he said, so I can only be sure about the presence of the past and the presence of the future from the vantage point of the present. And which is quite interesting in the sense that a lot of architectural uh, theory is based on the phenomenology of the present, and that any theory of any theory of conception of architecture implicitly or explicitly in, entail a conception of time. <clears throat> Whereas uh, another English philosopher by the name of MacTaggart, he lived around the turn of the century, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but at the same time as Frege, the German uh, logician, did. He came up with two series of time. One is the A-theoretic series, his own notion, and the other one is the B-theoretic series. A theoretical series refers to um, you know, time construed as a phenomenology of the present, of now, in the sense of St. Augustine's. You know. So time is, in a sense, a series of now that is moving. Whereas B theoretical series is a more objective in the sense it is indexical time, it's the time of the calendars, of dates, of events, you know, and so forth. And don't forget earlier when I told you that architecture is implicated in the universe, universal structuring of time. Right? In our case, it's the Judeo-Christian uh, calendar. Right? So architecture is also implicated in the structure. And so uh, the reason I'm uh, thinking about this notion at least to uh, give you something to think about is you know, time is an internal ingredient of architecture. So MacTiger came up with these two notions. And he came up to the radical conclusion that these two notions taken in and of itself is unreal. And without trying to synthesize these two notions, he you know, sort of dismissed time as an illusion, which a lot of uh, ancient uh, cultures tends to do. Now for Kant, the German philosopher, and Husserl, the time is nothing but the internal, sorry, well, is nothing but the form of innocence, a phenomenology of internal time consciousness, that is the intuition of our own inner self, and therefore yields no discernible geomet geometrical form. Whereas, uh, opposed to that is the theory of, theory of relativity, where time is completely absorbed in the geometry of hyperspace. And so, you know, when we talk about time as a dimension, we're talking about the spatialization of time. So a circle, a two-dimensional circle in time is essentially a tube. So one might ask as to what is the status of time in modal space, in modal logic? Is there a modal conception of time? Since modal space occupies the, the dimensions of hyperspace, because it is folded within itself, along with other, other mathematical dimensions, time is also folded within the modal structure of the mechanosphere. It is interesting because uh, in one of the uh, student party that I went to a couple of uh, weeks ago, one of the students sort of uh, half jestingly teased me, uh, saying, referring to Baram's project for NARA. I'm not trying to defend Baram's, but. Uh, he had made a comment that the project was done in six dimensions. And the student just, you know, oh, it was done in six dimensions, you're not sure. He was telling me, and I asked the student, well, maybe perhaps uh, whether he did or he did not, I don't know. You know but uh, do you know there's a notion of a hypercube or a hyperspace? And that one can project the shadow of a hypercube. And you can literally draw that four dimension, the shadow of a four-dimensional reality on two-dimensional surface. He said, really? Yeah, but what is that? You know? So, uh, 
you know, for us architects, sometimes uh, it's, uh, it's, we're bordering on sort of a certain kind of uh, ignorance. I don't mean to be critical, but um, I was like that too when I was a student for many years. And I think it is very important to know from physics and mathematics that these guys are thinking about some very, very abstract terms about which we have no direct physical correlations. Uh, I'm referring to the uh, portable wall diagram. But nevertheless, they are real and true within their own sort of discipline, within the logic, for instance, in mathematics. Uh, I was reading that book, uh, I'm sorry, uh, on chaos. There was a conference on Nobel uh, Prize winners, including Ilya Prigojin and Steve Smiley from Berkeley, who's a mathematician. He has done an uh, innovative uh, mathematical discovery in the, uh, the, the mathematics of chaos. And uh, in his opening uh, statement, he said something very interesting. In the audience was Mendel Brock, uh, Ilya Prigojin, and a whole host of other chaos uh, scientists. He says that mathematicians, uh, when they formulate mathematical uh, entities, they have nothing. There's no bag of tricks or no book of uh, pre-established formulations that they can turn to. You know, the mathematicians work in that possible universe of mathematical possibility. And through their own sort of logical uh, acumen, they discover the consistency of these new types of undiscovered logical and mathematical formulations. Whereas, unlike in physics, and I'm not saying that physics is less uh, significant, but you know, for instance, we all know that uh, Einstein could not have discovered the theory of relativity without uh, the pre-established notions about Ramian geometry. In fact, he relies on the instruments, of, uh, the mathematical tools that are already discovered and formulated by mathematicians, and that's sort of through his own innovative insight and sort of reconfiguration of these uh, formulations, he's able to apply it to the physical universe. So there's a fundamental difference in the way mathematicians work and physicists work. And I'm referring to this just to give you an idea that it is not unrealistic for mathemat mathematicians to think in terms of infinite dimensions. And uh, for instance, uh, one of the uh, recent uh, provocative notions about the universe is the so-called string theory, which you know, to be sort of consistent, to be viable as a sort of a theoretical hypothesis requires, if I'm not mistaken, 10 dimensions. And of course, uh, a, a physicist of uh, you know, Richard Feynman's uh, persuasion, who was a profound phys physicist uh, scientist at Caltech, died a couple of years ago, he, so he hated uh, string theory bunch of you know, the theoretical concepts having no sort of correlation to physical reality. And so he was quite critical about this string theory. But whereas like somebody like Ed Witten, who's at the uh, Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, you know, the guy just, you know, it's very natural for him to think in terms of 10 dimensions, you know, 20 dimensions, an infinite number of dimensions. And that maybe perhaps, I'm also of the persuasion that, uh, that we need to think about it. Maybe perhaps, even though they are so far-fetched from architecture, maybe perhaps in a way that this is, this, there is as yet an undiscovered way to, to incorporate them into an architectural notion. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason why I accepted to uh, talk about uh, architecture, because I think architecture potentially, and depends how you choose to formulate and perceive and conceive architecture, it can respond to a multi-dimensional hyperspace. Okay, now, where is architecture in this state of affairs? Since architecture is already embedded within the reality of being, its function on the plane of expression as a systematic logic of embodiment. Since autopoiesis is an intrinsic part of being, architecture participates and co-evolves within the mechanosphere as an expression of its autogenetic logic of embodiment. Here, the concept of architecture refers not just to a thing or a building, but a statistical ensemble within an, within an adaptive landscape. An emergent phenomena symptomatic of the machinic orders within semiological regimes. Is architecture not ex the expression of desiring machines? Again, another phrase from Deleuze. If we extend the notion of ma a machine beyond machinic arrangements, so that don't think the machine as a kind of have its own kind of a strange desire, but the constellation of all social, political, mechanical, ideological, formal arrangement produces their own internal engines of desire. Desiring machines within which we are all implicated and folded within its logical nets. So much so that the dialogical oscillation between the implicated and explicit orders of the Mercanosophia 
of the implicate and the explicate orders of the mechanosphere has produced a universe of counterfactual discourse that is both real and virtual at the same time. I'm almost getting there. These desiring machines are, in symbolic terms, the engines of reality, driven by the logic of the other within the same. The love gasoline of Duchamp dissipates across the entire field of architecture with various intensity, with various intensities of ontological thresholds as it dissipates and reconfigures territorial organizations along enunciative trajectories. The mechanosphere is the abstract machine par excellence, a reality engine. that perpetually self-organizes and pro proliferates itself in modal space. Here, of course, I'm sort of using a diagram here to infer and extrapolate onto another uh, modal condition. Then I would uh, need another type of diagram. Its logic of possibility stands from the mathematical universe. Of, its logic of possibility stands from the mathematical universe of constructability and maintain a meta -con continuity between the factual and the counterfactual in logical mathematical space. Now, let me uh, say one thing about constructability. The idea of constructability. The fact that something is mathematically constructible doesn't necessarily mean that it is it's physically constructible, right? Because something that you construct in physical space corresponds to the laws of physics. Whereas for mathematicians, there are a lot of mathematical formulations that you can construct theoretically that has no f immediate direct or literal physical correlate. And that do not necessarily render them as unreal. They are just as real. Therefore, it seems necessary to extend the phenomenology of the embodiment of time beyond the historiographical delimitations marked by the space of experience you know, that all, all of us share on the one hand and the horizon of expectation on the other. And according to Heraclitus, another philosopher from uh, ancient Greeks, uh, he says that you, don't, you will not discover the unexpected, the unexpected unless your expectation, the horizon of expectation itself open to that possibility. Therefore, a systematic logic of embodiment of architecture is, I'm sorry, therefore, a systematic logic of the embodiment of architecture as a spatialization of time and information can occur within modal space if one do not preclude the metaphysical possibility of the unexpected, of the counterfactual, and of the autogenetic logic of the strange and the uncanny that resist domestication by the semiological mechanism of organizations. Isn't the lizard, I'm talking here, I'm talking big lizard, not just these tiny little lizards, the big lizard that you find in Mexico. A phylogenetic expression of the strange and the uncanny within the adaptive landscape. You know, how many of you have sort of spent time staring into a lizard, put it on the table, right, on the drafting table, trying to think about architecture, and look, staring into the lizard? I think uh, in, in general, architecture resists you know, the lizard as a visitor. The lizard, the lizard is never welcome with an architecture. And one of the, uh, and I, I would use uh, in one of the uh, review last uh, semester for a thesis to I said, I would review, uh, I, I would use the lizard as a sort of measure uh, of the, the degree of domestication within any architecture, because I think the lizard, the lizard is something that's very, uh, it's, it's resist the kind of domesticated landscape. Like imagine going back home, you know, you have, you have cats and dogs, and so, and so they wiggle the tail, and so you feel, take off your jacket, and they welcome you. But imagine a big lizard sitting on the you know, living room. And the same thing is true with the owl, too. You know, owl has been a symbol you know, throughout the ages. You know, they are sort of strange, they are wise, but they also kind of diabolic, but diabolical. Right? And I think, uh, Instead of uh, designing a building or any architecture that looks like a lizard, I think what is more crucial is to understand the nature of the genetic logic of the evolution of a lizard. And so I would propose that uh, architecture that occurs within modal space has to incorporate a genetic logic. And out of the genetic logic, that you can discover something that totally uh, surprises you. And uh, in closing, for this text, uh, there's a quotation from Virgil. He says that uh, we, def we d determine our destiny based on the gods we choose to believe. Okay, for now, I'm gonna sh start showing you uh, 
some of my work. I'm going to bombard you with these images. Uh, now, these images here are from uh, cellular automata. These are essentially uh, diagrams of uh, attractors. Uh, I was planning to talk about the universe of cellular automata, automata, which I'm very interested in right now. I'm trying to sort of interpret and copy from a modal sort of perspective. Uh, I haven't got to the point yet, maybe perhaps next time. Uh, and uh, if you look at these uh, images, uh, and you uh, see some resemblance of some of the architect architectonic forms that I'll be showing. I must also caution you uh, that the images, the project that I'll be showing you, are just one step away from becoming building. So I hope you can bear with me and uh, take it for what it is. And I will not try or even attempt to explain what they are, other than the fact that each of them is produced by a genetic logic of transformation, a recursive formula. And I didn't try to design it because it looks good or because it looks you know, proportional or interesting, but it is based on a systematic transformation. All right, uh, from now on until the last, uh, can we have sound? A little bit of entertainment here. Music by, it's called Neroli by uh, Brian. touch here. Yeah. I'm going to have trouble with this. Moving fast. By the way, these are computer images. They're all constructed within the computer space. That's a fractal element. I said I wasn't going to talk about it.
Next stuff is a microphone, it turned out to be. Do you have any questions? No questions about mortal logics? No possible conceivable co questions? Thank you very much. Oh, you have. Yes. Oh, I see. It's uh, difficult to, pro pro probably a number of uh, issues, I think, maybe perhaps, uh, I'm not trying to be apologetic, but uh, maybe it needs clarification. Maybe perhaps I didn't articulate it very well. Uh, so maybe perhaps they are staged uh, in a context that is not quite explicitly architectural. 
but uh, if you are, if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to uh, respond to you. Uh. Oh, I see. Uh, for one thing, I'm not, I'm not interested in explanation. I'm in interested in. Um, uh, you can read books about those things. Uh, I'm not trying to be evasive, but uh, my intention was to uh, open up the way we conceptualize architecture by introducing certain concepts. And I think uh, by no means I'm, I'll be the last one here to tell you that uh, the concept that I introduce you um, is totally consistent. I mean, these are my reflections. Uh, on one level, you have to take it at that. But on another, you know, you have to uh, uh, begin to uh, quest question about your own sort of a system about thinking about architecture. So it's not so much I'm here just to explain you how a hammer is being sort of made or put together, but I can talk about these technically, how I construct them in geometrical space. But I don't like to do that. Uh, I'd rather do it in my class. Uh, but uh, in a lecture like this, I would rather introduce concepts and ideas that are provocative and that are you know, for you to think about. Uh, I'm, I'm of the uh, sympathy with you that, of course, I should try my best to explain clearly what I'm tr trying to uh, express. But I, it's clear to me. And of course, you know, because I wrote it, there's no doubt. I'm try not trying to be uh, um, apologetic about it. But uh, if you do have any specific questions, I'd be more than happy to respond. You know, that's, I know, I, ex I, I appreciate that question. I sort of anticipated that. Uh, by no means, you know, uh, I can always do so much. And because these computer graphics are, uh, are rather, I would rather call them constructions rather than graphics. <coughs> because they seem so removed uh, from the uh, homeless, and the, uh, the earthquake in Los Angeles and so forth. But, uh, you know, I, for one thing, don't intend to disassociate. I mean, just, you know, we've got to be uh, also realize that architecture has many levels and it's, it, we're finite. And a lot of times uh, it has to do with the function of our own interest. I'm not trying to be evasive. But I'm equally, uh, I think, uh, it's interesting in uh, a lot of social political issues. But I think there is another connected dimension. If you remember the diagram that I told you, any kind of abstraction is not totally removed or detached from whole larger epistemological sort of matrix that within which we're implicated. So if I don't do it, you know, if I don't address it explicitly in this lecture, or maybe perhaps maybe I might do it some other time, or someone, one of you can do it. But I cannot do everything. So for today's lecture, I'm just trying to focus on the idea of a modal space, and that these constructions that I have produced are essentially possibilities that are produced by the formal system, whether the computer itself and the software that I use. And I'm limited by that. You know, if I uh, have you know, uh, more mathematical sort of acumen and uh, if, I can, if I know how to program the computer, I mean, they are, these are not just the kind of things that I'm interested in. There are a lot of other stuff that I would like to explore, but I'm limited by the resources, both financial, intellectual, and physical. So I'm not sure whether I'm responding to you or not, but uh, I think soci I mean, these are sociological constructs. I mean, don't take it too literally. I mean, the, ten the natural tendency is that these geometrical constructions are totally removed from reality and social problems, but we've got to look at them from the perspective and vantage point of a cultural sort of a situation. Remove a physical point of view? Yeah, I agree with you, yeah. Uh, there is n there isn't a kind of a programmatic function that normally architecture has. And that's why I qualify it so these are one step away from. Up. You know, <laughs> I would think of the opposite. It you know, I cannot have sketched you the most open, you know, way of looking architecture by introducing this notion of modal space, okay? So I would totally disagree with you, even though I would agree with you in the fact that I didn't stress social issues. Yes, I'm guilty of that, but it doesn't mean that it is not inclusive. Or it, the system is much larger to contain what you're talking about. I might sound kind of a 
tap dancing with you, but uh, it is, you know, I, I want to believe that all levels of issues are implicated. So I, I, I'm not worried about it. I think you're separating many concepts. I don't think it's healthy. Huh? I'm sorry, I, 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 I miss what you say. <laughs> Explorations in mode space. Any more questions? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>